All right, welcome everybody. Since our Baldur's Gate 3 crew can't meet up this week, tonight we're going to be digging something else up from the past. Something that humanity was perhaps not meant to dig up. The Lurking Horror is a 1987 text adventure by Dave Liebling, who, along with Mark Blank and Steve Moretzky, made... Oh, shit. Oh, man, right off the bat, we're getting raided. Ira, hey, good to see y'all. Welcome, raiders. Hope all's going well tonight. What were you playing? Anyway, getting back to my uh, introduction here. So yeah, 1987 text adventure, who along with, uh, uh, you know, Dave Liebling, Mark Blank, Steve Moretzky, they made some of the most iconic and memorable entries in the uh, interactive fiction genre. Liebling, Liebling, the guy who wrote this, is one of the minds behind the Zork series, the Enchantress, Enchantress series, Starcross. If you've played any text adventure games, you've played something he either had a hand in or indirectly influenced. Trying to play, play, trying to play Pagan, but then we took a long walk in the dark side. Nice, nice. Hope all went well. Anyway, these games, especially those made by Infocom, they have a reputation for being fiendishly difficult if you don't know what you're doing. Er, yeah, if you don't know what you're doing. Some of them were like Sierra ga adventure game grade sadistic years before Sierra themselves were known for it. But there was something special about them despite this. They tended to be more like, you know, he's playing Peglin, not to be mistaken for Poglin, for a while five minutes before Kirby unleashed the beast. <laughs> uh, that's good stuff. But yeah, it's text adventure games, they tended to be more story and environment driven with memorable set pieces and kind of complex character interactions, relative for the time, of course. Like, my sister and I played a bunch of these when we were kids. This game, as the title should tell you, is more horror driven, with Lovecraft's writing and I believe Stephen King as particular influences. Now, for my money, this is one of the best in the genre. This is right up there with like a Mind Forever Voyaging, Planet Fall, etc. It's set in like a 1980s XP of MIT. It's worth mentioning that Infocom was based in Massachusetts, and it's become kind of a period piece, which I think fits in that a lot of old technology takes on weird esoteric properties the further we get from it. The writing has stuck with me over the years, and I got curious how well it would hold up. Luckily, I remember most of the puzzle solutions, so there should be minimal fumbling around lost. Now, this being a text adventure, it's going to be mostly me reading and then talking through the puzzle solutions, so those of you who tend to put these on in the background, today's your lucky day. That said, we are going to try to make this a little more visually interesting. I'm using a mapping program I found, trisbort.io, to build out a map of the game and leave notes about where we are and where everything is. We'll have a space for our current objectives down here, and for funsies, I'll be making a list of crimes we commit in our quest as well. This is still an adventure game, and we are going to be stealing a lot of stuff, and that's just the start of where this goes. You know how they are. A degree of disregard for the law and common decency is not only helpful, it's essential. Anyway, it's 1987, we're a student at George Underwood Edwards Institute of Technology, it's winter and a crushing blizzard, and we've got a paper to finish. Let's get to it. You've waited until the last minute again. This time it's the end of the term, so all the TechNet terminals in the dorm are occupied. So off you go to the old comp center. Too bad it's the worst storm of winter. Murphy's Law, right? And you practically froze to death slogging over here from the dorm. Not to mention jumping at every shadow, what with all the recent disappearances. Time to find a free machine, get to work, and write that 20-page paper. We're currently in the terminal room right here. This is a large room crammed with computer terminals, small computers, and printers. An exit leads south. Banners, posters, and signs festoon the walls. Most of the tables are covered with waste paper, old pizza boxes, and empty Coke cans. There are usually a lot of people here, but tonight it's almost deserted. A really whiz-bang PC is right inside the door. Nearby is one of those ugly, ugly molded plastic chairs. Sitting in a terminal is a hacker whom you recognize. So yeah, the better written entries in the genre encourage you to look around and collect details and such, so I'm going to uh, use verbose here to keep room descriptions on as we move in between rooms. So let's have a look at our hacker friend over here. Look at hacker. The hacker sits comfortably on an office chair facing a terminal table, or perhaps it's just an old, a pile of old listings as tall as, a terminal ta as tall as a terminal table. He's typing madly, using just two fingers, but achieves speeds that typists using all ten fingers could only dream of. He's apparently debugging a large assembly language program, as the screen of his terminal looks like a spray of completely random characters. The hacker is dressed in blue jeans, an old work shirt, and what might, and what, what might once have been running shoes. Hanging from his belt is an enormous ring of keys. He is in need of a bath. So yeah, it, by looking at people, you'll collect details about the, inf the environment, and you start to notice things that the game wants you to notice, that it singles out as important. We will be... The, the ring of keys will be important later on, I assure you. 
But anyway, we've got work to do. <laughs> Debugging machine code in a hex editor. Yeah, there's stuff about this game that definitely goes back, and obviously this is way before my time, but it has achieved a certain... Looking back on this now, it definitely has an 80s feel to it. Anyway, inventory. As you can see, we're carrying an assignment, which if we read it, Laser printed on creamy bond paper. The assignment is due tomorrow. It's from your freshman course in The Classics in the Modern Idiom, better known as 21014. It reads, in part, 20 pages on modern analogs of Xenophon's Anabasis. You're not sure whether this refers to the movie The Warriors or Alien, but this is the last assignment you need to complete in this course this term. You wonder, yet again, why a technical school requires you to endure this sort of stuff. Yeah, we've all been there, man. <laughs> Games making me feel for my M M M MUD days. Oh, man, that's definitely going back away. I haven't messed with those in a real long time, but I know what you mean. Anyway, let's have a seat. And get this bad boy going. So we're looking at the PC, this is a beyond state-of-the-art personal computer. Pay attention here. It is a 20 is a 1024 by 1024 pixel color monitor, a mouse, an attached hard disk, and a local area network connection. Fortunately, one of its features is a prominent help key. It's turned is currently turned off. Let's turn it on. The computer powers up, goes through a remarkably fast self-check, and grit and greets you, requesting login, please. The only sound you hear is a low, very low hum. So this was an early form of copy protection. If you look at the little documents, like the in-universe documents that came with the game, you would find your login and password kind of hidden amongst them. So fortunately, I've gone ahead and looked that up. 232-5412, which is our student ID. Oop. Enter. Er, type. 872 Password, please. Which I believe... Olorosoth. I don't know if that's in reference to anything. I looked it up and it just went back to this game, which uh, appears to be just a random word that will sound like it kind of fits what the game's going for horror-wise. Anyway, the computer responds. Good evening. You're here awfully late. It's a very snarky computer. It displays a list of pending tasks, one of which is in blinking red letters, with large arrows pointing to it. The task reads, Classics Paper. Some particularly the ominous words next to it say, Do Tomorrow. And more reassuringly, a menu next to it that reads, Edit Classics Paper. So, click Edit Classics Paper. I think also click Menu works. The menu box is replaced by the Yak text editor, and the menu box is listing the titles of your files. The one for your paper is highlighted in a rather urgent shade of red. Or urgent looking shade of red. Okay. Click, uh, File. Click paper. Some of the hassle of these is trying to figure out what specifically you're supposed to, what you specifically you're supposed to put into the text parser that the game will recognize. So that's always kind of fun. Anyway, you click the box for your paper, and the box grows reassuringly until it fills most of the screen. Unfortunately, the text that fills it bears no resemblance to your paper. The title is the same, but after that, there is something different, very different. Let's take a look. The paper appears to be a facsimile overlaid with occasional typescript. The text is mostly in a sort of old English you've never seen before. What you read is a combination of incomprehensible gibberish, Latinate pseudo-words, debased Hebrew and Arabic scripts, and an occasional disquieting phrase in English. As you look at it more closely, you find it hard to focus on the screen, but impossible to look away. Your finger strays toward the more box. Let's read more. Let's read some more. You click the More box and read what appears. The second page is much, much like the first, but around the edges, not when you look at it straight, it's almost readable. There's something about a summoning, or a visitor. Okay, this is getting a little weird here. Let's read some more. Instead, you find your figure moving towards the More box and you touch it. The screen feels oddly cold. The third page is in the same script as the first, but laid out like a poem. There are woodcut illustrations, which are qu queasily disturbing. There's a translation, or notes for one, typed between the lines of the poem. Yeah, this is how we summon Cthulhu, boys and girls. Oh, just wait. He returns. He's called back. The loyal ones, acolytes, make a sacrifice. Those who survived will meet him, be absorbed, eaten. They will live, yet die. Forever will be, is, nothing to them. To him, his place, lair, burrow, must be prepared. His food, offerings, must be prepared. Call him forth, invite him with great power. Only an acceptable, tasteful sacrifice will call him forth. He will be grateful, satiated. The rest is even more fragmentary. 
Okay, I think we need to talk to someone about this. Clearly someone's been papering over our assignment, and this is going to complicate our ability to pass this course. Let's uh, go. Let's stand up and go get our hacker friend. Ah! Instead, you find your finger moving toward the more box, and you touch it. The screen feels oddly cold. The fourth page is a photograph. You try to re recoil from the screen, but cannot. Fascinated and repelled at the same time, you wonder, is that a mouth? And what is in it? Okay, yeah, we need to call for help here. Instead, you find your finger moving towards the more box, and you touch it. The screen feels oddly cold. You faint, and when you awaken... Oh, interesting. I completely forgot this game had sounds attached to it. I don't know if I ever got those working. When I first played this, it was with the... Uh... Oh, God, the original discs probably would have been back in 90. Two, I think, when I first played it. No, 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 it, it would have been about 1990, earlier than that. But yeah, the, the last time I played this was on the Lost Treasures of Infocom, which was like a collection of various um, various games under the Infocom banner, but I don't remember having sound on this, so that's interesting. Yeah, in the before times. Anyway, place. This is a place. Things move about on a bro ro broken, rocky surface. Harsh sounds split the air. Something sticky grabs at your feet. There's no color. Everything is drained of brightness. Dull. Lifeless. A path descends into the sh into a shallow bowl of black basalt. Anyway, uh... Guess go path. Hup. Down, probably. Here we go. Basalt bowl. You're at the bottom of a deeply cut, smooth basalt bowl. Dimly, she dimly seen shapes crowd you on all sides. Ahead, in the focus of the movement is a rock platform. Look at shapes. What's going on here? Hmm. The crowd re let's see, yeah, it just repeats the description. The crowd around you begins to sway and groan. They are expecting something. You are drawn forward by the noise. You stand before a low rock platform, more like an afterthought of piled rocks or a glacial moraine than a work of artifice. You are pushed against the pile by the crowd around you. One small stone stands out in the pile. Smooth, shiny, and glowing with a blazing light. Okay. Look at stone. It's a smooth, shiny piece of what might be obsidian. Scratched on it as a symbol. The symbol, on close examination, appears to have been carved into the smooth stone, perhaps with a claw. The symbol is like nothing you've ever seen, and somehow you know it has meaning. Okay. Let's take a look at this thing. Take a closer look at this thing. Suddenly the dimness becomes darkness, and the crowd around you explodes with excitement. You are jostled and shoved from all sides. A low keening begins, building into a deafening, almost mechanical chant. The darkness before you compacts and deepens. I think if we look at the darkness, we can get a bit more descriptions of it. You see a visible darkness, in a shape not easily grasped. The darkness before you, now visible, is a creature. It towers over the now silent crowd. The thing jerks this way and that, spraying a foul ichor. Its palps twitch expectantly, then pound impatiently against the rock. You can feel the smooth stone vibrating in your hand. I think we can get more now that it's manifest. Yeah, fire magic missile into the darkness. Oh, here we go. It is large, smooth, and yet scaly. It has too many limbs, and they are not in the right places. To look at it gives you a headache. The thing now turns, sensing the presence of the stone. It quests almost blindly for it, then those surrounding you thrust you forward. The thing stoops, its mandibles grasping you. You are lifted towards its gaping maw. The stench and the sounds issuing from it are overwhelming, and you fall unconscious. You are awakened by the thump of your head hitting the terminal in front of you. Falling asleep over term papers. It must have been a nightmare. Embarrassed, you glance around. Yes, the hacker is looking in your direction. He must have heard the thump. Fortunately, that monster doesn't appear to be a dread gazebo. That would be truly unfortunate. Yeah, no kidding. I don't think the... I don't know if the monsters in here are in reference to any sp particular thing from the Cthulhu Mythos. I, I think, um... Or Mythos. I, I don't know why I say that. Anyway, I, I think some of it obviously is inspired by that, but they kind of either go with their own descriptions or strategically withhold descriptions and sort of let your mind paint, the, paint in the uh, gaps there. Anyway... So we're back in the terminal room. Uh, we appear to have fallen asleep. Let's take a look at the PC. Look at screen. What exactly happened here? What, would, what did we miss? There's nothing recognizable on the screen. The hacker wanders over, trying to look nonchalant as he takes over your chair. Losing, huh? He asks wittily. 
He glances at your terminal, which displays a pattern of snow and unusual characters. He appears somewhat excited. So, ask Hacker for help. Be patient. The Hacker, mumbling under his breath, begins a flurry of activity. First the screen returns to something nearly normal, then windows begin popping up like toadstools after a rain. The screen looks a lot like the top of his terminal table, or the bottom of a trash can. Oh, wait while he works. The hacker types furiously, and the screen displays to you what looks like an explosion in a teletype factory. After a while, he says, Chomping file system, your directory's gone seriously west. I fixed it. He checks the screen. It was mixed up on the file server with some files from the Department of Alchemy. He grunts. People's names for their nodes are getting weird. This one's called Lovecraft. He pauses. Your paper is gone, though. Sorry. Maybe they could help you down there. It's all more or less original material. That's kind of my understanding, yeah. So anyway, something in the system ate our paper, and it has to do with the Department of Alchemy, which, interestingly, is a real thing at MIT, or at the very least, there's a door that says Department of Alchemy. Or there was at the time when they made the game, and it became kind of an in-joke thing. So we're going to have to go looking for them, because it looks like they've got our paper. So we're going to update our task here. Finish our paper. Find out what happened to our paper. Investigate Department of Alchemy. Surely someone there can help us figure this out. Anyway, now we got to look around. So, yeah. Maybe a little bit derivative. Yeah, I could imagine that. Anyway, um, ask Hacker about Department of Alchemy. <laughs> if my universe can have it, a Tower of Magi... Wait, I, I'm a wizard. <laughs> uh, oh boy, I stumbled there. You can't see the department... Okay, ask Hacker about Alchemy. Hacker studiously ignores you, loath to admit there's something he doesn't know about. Okay. Ask Hacker about Lovecraft. Wasn't he a fantasy author? Uh, in the very loosest sense of the word. Right. Okay, we're not going to get any more answers here. We're going to have to find this Department of Alchemy and tell them to give us our fucking paper back. We're working all night on that thing. It's 20 damn pages. Anyway, down to the second, or south to the second floor. This is the second floor of the computer center. An elevator and call buttons are on the south side of the hallway. A large, noisy room is to the north. Stairs also lead up and down for the energetic. To the west, a corridor leads into the smaller room. So, I made a sort of starter map with some basic locations here for the computer center. We'll be expanding on it as we go, and I'll show off a little bit how it works. <laughs> Lovecraft's work is technically sp speaking split between fantasy and science fiction. Yeah, I can see that, because, yeah, it's, it, it, it's essentially real-world stuff, but it's sort of breaking at the edges because there's this vast layer of reality that we're only just barely aware of, and our interactions with it are fleeting and dangerous. Anyway, this is the lobby of the computer center. An elevator and call buttons are to the south. Oop, just going to move over here a little bit. Stairs also lead up and down to the north is Smith Street. So we're going to have to go out into the blizzard. And here's the thing. Because this is in the middle of winter, it's actually dangerous to be outside for long. So if you're in any outdoor area for a long period of time, you will eventually freeze to death. So when you go anywhere, you got to hustle. Hey, Zero, good to see you. Basically, Cthulhu ate our paper, and we're going to go so settle his hash. Anyway, uh, let us head north, because I think we'll have to go outside to get to the main building. Are there snow grooves? There are not, but there are grooves in this game, although they're not really specified. If you're in a dark room and you don't immediately back out, you will die. So I'm going to go ahead and save the game here. Say Cthulhu ate my paper. All right, out on a Smith Street. We're going to go ahead and add a room here. Smith Street runs east and west along the north side of the main campus area. At the moment, it's an arctic wasteland of howling wind and drifting snow. On the other side of the street, barely visible, are the lidless eyes of streetlights. The street hasn't been plowed, or if it has been, it did no good. Alright, so now we're going to move this around a little bit. So we've got room to build out, so we'll make a room for Smith Street here. For the most part, it's pretty good about adjusting as you need to when you're making your map. The idea is this is something you would use for your, making your own text adventures and such, but in this case we're going to be using it to sort of paint out the paint out our progress as we go. Anyway, so Smith Street. Just mark it as outdoors. Because yeah, if we connect it with these fellas right here, 
then I think, yeah, it should automatically adjust. There we go. Kinda, yeah. It is, strictly speaking, a map-making tool, which it works pretty well for that. Anyway, okay, east and west along the north side of the main campus area, so we can't cross the street. So we're looking for the main building that has the Department of Alchemy in it. So let's go east. Smith Street runs east and west toward the computer center here. To the south is a dilapidated gray wooden building. The street is an impassable sea of blowing and drifting snow. So we'll make another room real quick. There we go. All right. South is a dilapidated gray wooden building. Let's check it out. Push your way to the comparative warmth of a laboratory. It is pitch black. Oh, goody. So, yeah, this is what I was talking about. If we try to do anything other than immediately retreat north, we will die. Yeah, it's a map maker that extort, ma export maps for stuff like TADS or Inform. Yeah, yeah. It's a nice little program. I was pleased that there was something specifically for the... Uh, what I was looking for here. So yeah, anytime you enter a building after being outside, you immediately warm back up. You've got about mm, 10 moves or so before you freeze to death. So impenetrable snow drifts block the street. So let's go back this way. Impenetrable snow drifts block the street. Damn. Okay. So we'll have to go another way. In fact, I think there's another way to the north of Smith Street. Elevator and call buttons are to the south. Stairs also lead up and down. All right, let's go down. Technically speaking, Inform exports the Z machine, which is what the game Carl's playing is made into, but it's written in Zill, an older language. Interesting, interesting. Anyway, in the basement, bare concrete walls line a wide corridor leading east and west. An elevator and call button are to the south. Stairs also lead up for the energetic. Yeah, floor for floor to ceiling run wire channels and steam pipes. Slouching nearby is an urchin. He's a youngish teenager wearing a ski hat, running shoes, and a bulky, suspic suspiciously bumpy, threadbare parka. He's jumpy and looks suspiciously at you. The urchin has disappeared. All right. We'll be seeing him again. Anyway, so corridor leading east and west. We'll see if there's a connecting path to the temporary basement. During the Second World War, some temporary buildings were built to house war-related research. Naturally, these buildings, though flimsy and ugly, are still around. This basement is one of them. Oh, hang on a second. We'll... Connect that. Forgot to make this down. All right. Basement extends west. The stairway goes up, and a large passage is to the east. All right. A pair of electricians, gloves, and a crowbar here. Well, you know what we got to do in an adventure game, huh? Take all. A pair of electricians, gloves taken, crowbar taken. And now, we are officially committing theft. A crime spree has begun! Let us proceed. Okay, so... Stands west, the stairway leads up. A large passage is to the east. Let's look around some more. Oop, oh, pitch black. Oop, oh, got it back up. Alright. Up, oh, it's pitch black. So that probably leads to the, to the uh, laboratory or whatever that room was. So let's go back down. We need a flashlight. The Z and Z machine and ZIL also happens to stand for Zork. Yeah, it's something like Zork... Uh... Something language. I forget what the I stands for. Anyway. So we'll have to look around until we find a light source or find another way to get to the building in question. So what is... West here? Arrow basement. There's a forklift here. Alright, let's move these down a little bit. Zork implementation language. Thank you. Alright. We will be making use of that forklift at some point, I assure you. All right. To the west is a stairway. To the east, the basement area continues. <laughs> Does Cthulhu have his forklift license? Cthulhu is not forklift certified. If we catch him using it, that's going to be a tw that's going to be at least a fifty dollar fine. Okay. So now to the west, we got another stairway. Main reason I'm doing this is because these the games generally aren't all that long once you know what to do, and this is etched in the memory well enough that I do remember most of the puzzle solutions. So it's mostly just trying to remind myself where everything is. But also, I didn't want to do it all ahead of time, because there are some locations that are kind of spoilery. So let's adjust you. There we go. Okay, excellent. Outstanding. Drop it on one of the orbs. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Now we're in the aero lobby. This is the lobby of the aeronautical engineering building. Stairs lead down and a corridor heads out to the main building. All right. I wonder if I can move several of these at once. Bitchin'! Yes! 
It's the little things that please me about stuff like this. Okay, so stairs up into the Aero Lobby. All right, this is the lobby of the Aeronautical Engineering Building. Stairs lead down, and a corridor heads south to the main building. Drop it on the dot like I thought. You got it. All right, Infinite Corridor. The so-called Infinite Corridor runs from east to west in the main campus building. This is the west end. Side corridors lead north and south, and a set of doors leads west into the Howling Blizzard. Okay, so we're going to move over here. It's a plastic container here. There's a largish machine being operated down the hall to the east. So, uh, this will be a bit messy. I apologize. I am only an amateur map maker. Or map drawer, I should say. Alright, so, infinite corridor. Just leave a note that the plastic container is there, whatever that might be. <laughs> I know, I know. Shameful display. Alright, let's look around. Fre refresh my memory. What is. Oh, connect this. Refresh my memory, what is west? Okay, Mass Avenue. This is the main entrance to the campus buildings. Blindly, blinding snow obscures the stately Grecian columns and rounded dome to the east. You can barely make out the inscription on the pediment, which reads, George Vunderwood Edwards. I think that might be an intentional typo there. Founder, yeah, they're doing the old type is V instead of view. P. David Liebling. Hey! The writer himself. Nice. Architect. Russell Lieblick, sound engineer. So I think, yeah, it's just giving a shout-out to the other guy that worked on this. West across Massachusetts Avenue or other buildings, but you can't see them. So. Plastic container contains fish, or anything else in the game features fish. I call dibs on the fish. Uh, there's some creatures that will probably be fish-adjacent, let's say. Mm. Alright, is there anywhere we can go out here? I don't think there is. So we can't cross the street. Can't go that way. Can't go that way. Is there a... I keep, forget if there's a list exits command. There is not. Okay. Eh, we can't cross the street. Alright. Not every room is going to be purposeful. It's a fairly sizable complex. Most of the stuff you interact with will have some purpose, but they do have some red herrings here and there. Anyway. Down the infinite corridor. I think the Department of Alchemy is here. So-called infinite corridor. Corridor extends both ways from here. Many closed and locked offices are, are to the north and south. Let's get another room going here. I wonder if the game actually does let you go north and south. Oh, maintenance man is here writing a floor waxer. So, okay, offices are all closed, locked, and dark. So, again, a lot of the writing in this game emphasizes that there's only a few people around on campus. And a lot of them are going to be strange. In fact, let's look at this maintenance man here. He looks tired, bored, almost zombie-like. All right, let's see if we can get past him. In a deft maneuver, the maintenance man steers the floor waxer into your path, blocking your advance. Hmm. Floor waxer waxes away to the east. All right, so we can go and see if we can squeeze past him. The so-called infinite corridor runs from east to west, blah, blah, blah. Maintenance man is here. There's a wall socket on one wall, and a heavy-duty power cord is plugged into it. The cord leads to a large floor waxer. All right. That definitely will not be a thing we interact with. No, we're going to be a good student, and we're just going to be focused on getting our paper done. All right, let's see if we can get past this guy. In a deft maneuver, the maintenance man steers the floor waxer into your path. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Ask maintenance man to move. He replies in a language you do not understand. The words are guttural and jarring. Ah, of course. No problem. I'll find someone who speaks... Uh... I don't know. I feel like we would recognize most languages, so it's going to be something probably Eastern European that we don't have an immediate sense of. We'll find someone that speaks Romanian. That's my guess. This guy's going to be speaking Romanian. Anyway. Deep one, probably. Yeah, no kidding. So, we can't squeeze by him, and we can't ask him to move. We'll have to go somewhere else and see if we can find another way around. Unfortunately, I do believe the Department of Alchemy is at the end of the hall, so there's not much we can do just yet. So, Back this way. <laughs> Hit him with a crowbar. Violence. You know what? I think the game lets you do that. Hang on a second. Always save before you try stupid stuff. <laughs> Unionize him. Go, you know what? You work too hard. Do you get time off, sir? Anyway, largest machine down the hall to the east. Okay. 
All right, there's a glass-fronted emergency cabinet here. Well, now, <laughs> extreme violence. Okay, so we got another chunk of the infinite corridor here. As mentioned, I do know the actual solution to this, and it's kind of insane. Let's look at the cabinet. It's one of those little cabinets you see in institutional buildings that usually contains a fire hose and a fire axe. This one seems to, it seems to only have an axe. It has a transparent window. There's writing on the cabinet. Read writing. Read cabinet. In case of emergency, break glass. Floor relax or waxes away to the east. Alright. Cabinet. Axe. Fuck yeah! Time off, the man re creature recoils and screeches as if you uttered some unknowable knowledge. <laughs> Alright. Well, no sense beating around the bush. We're gonna need that axe. In fact, we've got everything we need to solve this puzzle right here. So, let us... Break glass with crowbar. Glass sat smashes with a satisfying crash. Alright. Count. Destruction of property. We're moving up in the world. Alright. Take axe. Three counts theft. I like to imagine this co this campus stu this college student just walking around campus, worker workers gloves, crowbar, axe, look of purpose on their face, just that would be a good time to go literally anywhere else. I'm gonna move all this down a uh, scotch. There we go. Now let's go. So he did scoot off to the east. Let's see if we can go one more. All right, this is the east end. Corridor branches north and south here. All right, so we did get to the end of the hallway. That's good. Alternately, just a Tuesday. <laughs> That's the thing, yeah. We're still in the middle of the school year, so we're trying to get our paper done. So tomorrow is a school day. We're not on the weekend yet. Shifting this around as it gets more complicated will be fun. All right, so we can go north or south. This is good. So, north, the death maneuver, the maintenance man steers the floor waxer into your path, blocking your advance. Okay, let's go south. Motherfucker! The floor waxer continues waxing a section of floor nearby. Maintenance man operating it stares at you suspiciously. Yeah. Starting to look at my university's maps. Yeah, this is going to be a bit of a nostalgia trip. Because I still occasionally have dreams where I'll wake... I'll... Oh. Okay, yeah, I know how connections work. I will think I'm back in... School, I'll think I'm back in school, and I'll be, like, a couple weeks into the semester, and I'm like, oh, shit, I didn't go to that... I, I didn't go to my economics class, or I didn't go to uh, geometry or something. And it'll... That fear of having missed out on something will linger as I wake up, and I'll just briefly forget where I am. <laughs> I got an axe for chew. Chuck it! Hell yeah, let's try this. All right. Throw axe at maintenance man. Just for funsies, why not? The fire axe misses by a mile. Damn it! Okay, so clearly I'm not on the shot put team. Alright. Yell at maintenance man. Maintenance man isn't likely to respond. Figures. Alright. So, let's go ahead and actually solve this. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and put the gloves on. You put on the gloves. They're a little big, but not really such a bad fit at all. Yeah, <laughs> flip bird at maintenance, man. So, remember this here plastic container? This is floor wax. Okay, let's update our inventory here. Oh, right, and we got the stone. That's right, the gut we... We got a stone from the dream that we had about the stone, and this will be significant later. In fact, let's take a look at this thing. Sh smooth, shiny piece of what might be obsidian, scratched on it as a symbol. So yeah, it's the same description as it was in the dream. So, look at container. Plain cl plastic container with something written on it. The plastic container is closed. Fro <coughs> excuse me. Froba's magic floor wax and dessert topping. <laughs> nice. There's little bits of continuity here. Froba's was, I believe that is a Zor... I believe that's a Zork reference. I think that was, um, I think that was one of the wizards that was involved in the Great Underground Empire. So, 
The solution here is two stage. We need to disable the we need to disable the waxer, and then we need to deal with the maintenance man, who by now is starting to look kind of suspicious. Because this guy, he is deliberately trying to get us to stop us from proceeding, and there's not a lot we can do until we get past him. So I'm going to add get past maintenance man. Even so, the solution is kind of insane. So we are going to wait. We'll see if he moves off. So I kind of don't want waxes away to the east. Perfect. Okay. This takes some timing. All right. Now, open container. Smelly viscous liquid. All right. Cut power cord with axe. The axe crashes against the floor and the power cord severs. The whine of the floor waxes slows, and the maintenance man jerks to alertness. Alright, so we have two counts destruction of property. Yeah, that's the thing. There are things you can do in this game that absolutely can get you killed, and you will want the gloves on more than once when you do something dangerous. Now, if we wait, the maintenance man will sh show up, and he'll be pissed off at us, understandably. The maintenance man, growling foul-sounding imp imprecations, I don't know if that's a typo, if that's a word I'm not familiar with, descends from the floor waxer and heads toward you. So, let's uh, settle his hash. Is he here yet? Alright, here we go. The maintenance man lurches towards you with surprising speed. Now! Attack maintenance man with axe. You don't need to do this, but it's just kind of amusing the game lets you do this. The fire axe chops into his chest where it sticks. Ed Ames would be proud. The force of the blow staggers him a bit. He looks down at the axe with a certain perplexity, then pulls it free, the wound making a sickening, sickening sucking sound. The maintenance man stares with a maniacal intensity at your throat. An imprecation is a spoken curse. Okay, so, one count, assault. Oop, deadly weapony. Now, bear in mind, this man is obviously not human, but we don't know that at the time, and considering we just cut his power cord with an axe, I think he's operating out of a reasonable s sense of fight or flight here. Yeah, the axe did not work. Abort, abort. So here's the actual solution. Pour container on floor. It pours and spreads out like ants at a picnic. The floor is now covered from wall to wall with slippery floor wax. The maintenance man, attempting to get closer to you, enters the waxed part of the floor. He begins to slip and slide, barely able to maintain his balance, much less advance. The maintenance man continues slipping, falling, standing, and so on. He reminds you of a badly made wind-up toy. <laughs> it's rude to not p call people not human. The proper term is mortally challenged. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough, I suppose that was a bit prejudiced of me. Yeah, we looty tunes it. In fact, hang on a second. Did I drop my axe? There is, yes. The maintenance man continues slipping, falling, and standing, and so on. He reminds you of a badly made wind-up toy. Take axe. Yeah. One count. Attempted murder. And if you'll wait for just a minute, we can remove the attempted part. The maintenance man appears to shorten and almost dissolve. There's a great commotion, as though he's undergoing a convulsion of some sort, and then he appears to explode into a crowd of small, squealing creatures. These, seeing you, scuttle off in the opposite direction and disappear. That's very odd for a maintenance man. I'm gonna have to report this. Anyway, we can remove attempted from that. Because granted, he may not have been human, but he was still a legal employee of the college. So, on we go. Yeah, he was a semi-contained union. Yeah, he was a union of individuals working toward a single purpose. Actually, I think I can... Yeah, drop container. <laughs> exactly, yeah. We commenced in union busting, if you will. Ha <laughs> ha! But, uh, yeah, seriously. I have no idea what the hell that man actually was. But if you did not drop the wax, he assuredly would kill you. And it would make a comment about how you never actually see him breathe. <laughs> yeah, you buster, sorry, defriending. Yeah, it's okay, Zero. You know what, we're friends in spite of our vast ideological differences. Let's put it that way. Okay, so now that we're 
done with this. We can finally proceed down the hallway. And let's see what's at the end of the corridor that this guy was trying to stop us from getting. Okay. This is the central corridor of the nutrition building. The main building is south, and a stairway leads down. So, let's expand our map here. Yeah, that solution strikes me as a bit wild, because while it isn't that unintuitive, it is... Like, you wouldn't think pouring the floor wax out would kill the guy. You wouldn't think to kill the guy just to get past him. I think they could have done a little bit more to signpost. This character is obviously not human, but, eh, what can you do? Anyway, uh, let's see. Stairway leads down. Cluttered passage. The cluttered passage leads south southeast. It's full of apparently discarded electronic equipment, equipment, old rusty file cabinets, and other detritus. The stairway also leads up. But I assure you that will not be the last bit of weirdness we'll encounter here. You might say it's just getting started. All right. Leads southeast. <laughs> Text adventures, obvious signposting. <laughs> oh, just wait. There are puzzles you absolutely can bone yourself on Sierra style if you don't know what you're if you don't know what you're doing. Okay. Brown basement. This is a cluttered basement below the Brown building. Discarded equipment nearby blocks an already narrow hallway that terminates in a stairway leading up. The passage continues northwest. There's a pair of rubber boots here. All right. So. All right, rubber boots. We're going to go ahead and yoink those. Up our theft counter there. Might as well put them on. Snug, but okay. All right. Now, what is up? This is the lobby of the Brown Building, an 18-story skyscraper which houses the Meteorology Department and other outposts of the Earth Sciences. The elevator is out of order, but a long stairway leads to the roof, and another leads down to the basement. A revolving door leads out into the night. Okay, let's uh, get another room here. Alright, so elevator's out of order, but a long stairway leads up to the roof, another leads down to the basement, revolving door leads out into the night. Alright. Go ahead and save. I think there's a door somewhere here that's a one-way door that leads outside, and if you go out, you can't get back in, so it effectively kills you. So, out. Small courtyard. This courtyard is a triumph of modern architecture. It's spare, cold, angular, and overwhelming in size, and bears a striking resemblance to a wind tunnel whenever the breeze picks up. Right now, this is the true of the whole, cam whole campus, though. A huge mass lurks nearby, and an almost featureless skyscraper is to the north. Okay, so, small courtyard, outdoors. Alright, so what's this mass? You see nothing special about it. Uh-huh. Right. So it looks like the only way to go is back in. So, yep. Alright, let's go back to that infinite corridor, because I'm pretty sure the Department of Alchemy is down there. We need to get focused here. We still need to find out what happened to our paper. So, northwest. Up, fruits and nuts. South. And south. Chemistry building. Corridor is lined with closed, dark offices. At the south end of the corridor is a door with a light shining behind it. There's something written on the door. Painted on the door, in calligraphy indistinguishable from any door at tech, is the phrase Department of Alchemy. You always used to wonder what was behind that door. Aha! We have found our destination. Alright. Let's see who's home. Save early, save often. Knock on door. You knock on a door. The hollow sound reverberates down the hall. You sort of wish you'd knocked more softly. Alright. Let's be patient. Hmm. The door opens part way, revealing a professorial man in a white lab coat. He smiles. Good evening. I don't get many visitors this, this late. You're not one of my students, are you? He ushers you into the room without waiting for an answer, closing the door behind you. Department of Alchemy. Alright, so we got another one. Considering we had to literally kill a sort of man to get here, Professor's surprisingly nice. It appears to, appears to be completely oblivious of what happened outside. So, let's ask about this guy. So, sign-up sheet. Professor. Alright. So, let's take a look at the sign-up sheet. 
This appears, this appears to be a sign-up sheet for the lab. Strangely, although few daytime segments are used, almost all the nighttime ones are. <laughs> Excuse me. Most seem to have been taken by two different people, the professor and another, presumably one of his graduate students. The name of this graduate student is oddly familiar. Okay. Well, let's get our uh, paper sorted out. You have something that belongs to me, sir. I don't like your insinuations. The professor continues to gaze at you with malign intent. Okay. Ask professor about... Hang on a second. We're carrying an assignment. Show assignment to professor. He doesn't seem interested. Okay, what an asshole. Okay, ask professor about Lovecraft, the note on the computer. The machines in our department have names like that. Lovecraft wrote some stories about alchemy. You got Paracelsus, Dunsany, and... Uh, uh, is that Dunsany or Dunsany? I forget, don't forget how that's pronounced. Anyway, a couple others too. Suddenly, you remember why the graduate student's name was familiar. He was a missing student until his bo body was found smashed and broken at the base of the tallest building on campus. The professor continues to gaze at you with malign intent. Right. So that's an interesting little detail. So the other graduate student... So basically, the guy here, aside from the professor, ended up being one of the people that's gone missing and turned up dead. So that's a significant detail we'll want to put a pin in for now. You get the feeling there's just not going to be a lot we can get out of him. Missing students. I don't know anything about them. Tech is high pressure. Some people can't take it. Yeah, yeah, really getting that alchemy grind set going, huh? Okay, I don't think we're going to get anything out of this guy just yet, so let's get out of here. Alchemy door is closed. Open door. And out we go. Alright. Well, that was a bust. But, that detail about the missing student that turned up dead was interesting. He was found at the base of the tallest building on campus, and we just found out the brown building is a skyscraper, which, uh, relative to the rest of the campus. So that might be worth investigating. Let's go take a look. Figure we're not getting anywhere on our paper, we might as well try to solve the mystery. But I still like the chain of events here. What starts is trying to complete a simple task, get your paper done, rapidly spirals into violence and threats of murder and the weirdness lying just underneath them. So anyway, the elevator is out of order, but a long stairway leads up to the roof, and another leads down to the basement. So yeah, it escalates quickly, but there's a mood to this I kind of like. The idea is that we're basically trapped here in this storm with whatever is going on here, and clearly our life is in danger even if we don't realize it just yet. Like our character doesn't realize it just yet. Alright, let's go up. Because he was found at the base of the building, so it's quite possible that he jumped from it, or something else happened. So, up we go. This is the top of the stairway. A door leads out to the roof here, and you can hear the wind howling beyond. There's a sign on the door. Alright. Door leads out here, and you can hear wind howling beyond. There's a sign on the door. So, read sign. Alright. says, no admittance. In smaller handwritten letters below, this means you. Below that, in different writing, it says, who, me? All right. Let's open this door and take a look outside, see what we can find. Granted, this probably happened a while ago, but I'm sure we'll be the ones to crack the... Oh, fuck, it's locked. Okay. Can we get this open with a crowbar? Open door with crowbar. We've already committed violence. What's What else can we do here? It's locked. Okay. No, we're going to need a key for it. Now. Oh, sorry, I'm looking at the map here. Well, let's go down. Also, I just realized these are going to be relative directions. Like, this is stairs up connecting to it, but it would be stairs down going to it. So I'll probably want to rephrase that going forward and just say stairs. Anyway, we're going to need a key. Unfortunately, we do, we do know someone that has keys. So let's get back to it. Cluttered passage. Fruits and nuts. Down the infinite corridor. Past the scene of the crime. Actually, can we look at Waxer? Can we do anything with this? 
Large waxer, big enough to ride in. Actually, he sort of looks like a small bulldozer. The severed remnant of the power cord graces one end. I think we can even get in waxer. You are now in the floor waxer. Yeah, there's little things here you can interact with that don't necessarily have a purpose. There's some nice attention to detail in the game in terms of what the game lets you try. Not all of it is going to solve a puzzle, but it is fun to kind of mess around and interact with things. So we can't obviously can't do anything with the floor waxer, so out we go. Huh. Power cord is severed. Get out. Now on your feet. All right. So back this way to the infinite corridor. We need to make our way back to the computer center. Hacker, buddy old pal. What's say you do us a solid because you couldn't salvage our paper? There's our friend. All right. Give again. I wonder if we can tell him about what we've done. Our guilty conscience is, conscience is weighing us down. Let's tell him about our adventures with the maintenance man. Tell Hacker about maintenance man. Just little interest. Excuse me, I'm trying to tell you I just killed a man, and I did it on purpose. It's feeling like la like uh, last action hero here. Anyway, ask Hacker about Professor. Studiously ignores you, loath to admit there's something. Ask Hacker about missing students. Missing students? I knew one of them slightly. Not the sort who would go away, you know? He was sort of Hacker-esque. Not dumb for an undergrad, either. Not the type to disappear. All right. Ask Hacker about keys. I've accumulated a, key, a few keys over the years. I'm a licensed locksmith, which helps. I can get into any room at tech. He pulls the key ring out on its chain and shows off a key you hadn't noticed before. This is a master key. All right. That might be what we need here. Ask Hacker about master key. That's one of my best keys. It's a tech master key. Not that it really opens every door at tech, but I'd say three out of five at least. Naturally, some labs are off limits even to this key. All right, I think we're going to need that to continue our investigation. And here's where we get to one of the more Sierra-ish puzzles in the game. Not necessarily in its logic, but it's in your capacity to screw yourself. Ask Hacker for Master Key. Fat chance. This is a master key. What have you done for me lately? Okay. So, ask Hacker what he wants. I forget if there's a way to get a prompt here. I know what the solution is, but I forget if there's anything that actually tells you what he would want. Ask Hacker about what he wants. Hmm. Alright. I know, we, yeah, again, I know exactly what he's looking for. Yeah, I'd love some yummy Chinese food. Szechuan style. Hmm. Hacker turns to you and says, I don't know where I can get something to eat, what with all the snow. Well, there's one room in here we haven't explored yet, so let's check it out. Snelching nearby an urchin. Let's take a look at this guy. This is an urchin. He's the youngest teacher, a youngest, te youngish teenager wearing a ski hat, running shoes, and a bulky, suspiciously bumpy threadbare parka. He's jumpy and looks suspiciously at you. Okay, so ask urchin. As long as he's here, we might as well talk with him. Ask urchin about missing students. Hey, you guys got some students? Got students missing? We got kids gone missing. He looks at you suspiciously. You ain't the one done it, are you? He seems very nervous about talking to you. So this character. We will be interacting with him at a couple points. He's not just background in that he'll... He will pick up anything you leave lying around, and you might need to get to get it back from him later on, depending on whether you're done with it or not. So that bulky, that bulky, suspiciously bumpy parka is a clue that he's carrying stuff, including one item we will need. More on that later. He's also one of the few characters in the game that if you directly threaten him, he will kill you. He's actually got a knife on him, and there's no way you can physically overpower him. Anyway. So, in the kitchen, we've got some food. Man wants some Chinese food, which I believe we can find in here. Actually, what are these funny bones? Look at package. Snack food made with peanut butter and chocolate cake. Oh, that sounds good. But not what we're looking for. Open fridge. Hey, thanks, Kirby. Don't mind if I do. Mm. Opening the refrigerator reveals a two-liter bottle of classic Coke and a cardboard carton. Whoa! Take Coke and carton. Done.
Cardboard carton with an incomprehensible symbol scrawled on the top. Look at symbol on carton. Doesn't look like Chinese, English, or any other language you know. Hmm. The symbol looks oddly familiar. Okay, we're not going to get any help just looking at it. Open carton. Opening the carton reveals Chinese food. All right, so here's the puzzle. We need to cook this in order for the hacker to accept it, but we need to do it at a certain time. We need to set it for a very specific time limit, or we ruin the Chinese food. And if you do that, you cannot complete the game. So this is definitely something you would have to figure out either through trial and error or just check a guide. So if we look at the microwave, I believe it tells you how long you need to do. Microwave oven hangs over the kitchen counter. It has more complicated controls than your PC. There's an LED readout above the controls. The microwave is off and it's closed. All right, read microwave. How do you do that with the microwave oven? Read readout. Turn to display the current time and the word off. Uh, let's see. Forget exactly how long. Eh. We'll save and do some trial and error. Open microwave. Actually, I think the um, this might have been something that was in the stuff that came with the game. Again, another kind of copy protection thing. Believe if you set it for three minutes, it's long enough. Okay, put carton in microwave. You're beginning to tire. Okay, here's a thing. If you fall asleep in this game, you will die. Because so, there are things out there that will prey on you the second you let your guard down. So, how do we keep awake if we can't sleep? Caffeine, baby! Fuck yeah! Delicious! Contains caffeine, one of the four basic food groups. Too bad they make it with fructose these days instead of sucrose. You feel, feel much more alert and awake now. Outstanding! Alright, I wonder how much of this we've got. This is a partly empty 2-liter bottle of cold classic Coke. Alright, so it's not infinite. I, actually, I don't know. Maybe it was partly empty to begin with. I know you get a lot of it, more than enough to complete the game. It's not quite as tight on time as something like uh, Enchanter was, but this will be one of our resource considerations while we uh, run around getting stuff done. Anyway, uh, okay, controls, look at controls. Controls are labeled 0 to 9, WM, low, medium, high, start, clear, stop. Timer display now reads 3. Okay, so... Press medium. Bottom of the display now reads medium. Press 3. 0. Here we go. And start. Oop, press start. Timer now reads two. Timer now reads one. Microwave stops. Timer display now reads zero. Okay, microwave. Exciting! Warming up the Chinese food action. This is a carton of warm Sichuan, uh, Sichuan shrimp. Lovely red peppers poke out of the sauce. Nice! Making me hungry. I wonder if you take it outside, it'll actually cool off. In fact, let's test that. Oh, wait, wait, no, because we, uh... Yeah, because if we do that, we'll overwrite the save. Eh, I'm too lazy to make a separate save. Let's just give him the Chinese food. I'll test that on my own another time. Anyway, give Chinese food to Hacker. Yuck! This isn't warm enough. He thrusts it back in your hands. Okay, fine. Carton in microwave. Close microwave. Okay. Still not warm enough. God, this guy's picky. Alright. Third time's the charm. Alright. Ah, serious food! He plunges into the food with all the delicacy and table manners of a shark in a feeding frenzy. Soon a satisfied expression appears on his face. Now, what was it you were wanting? He asks. I think there's actually a range of time in which it is considered eatable, but I think if you go more than, like, eight or nine minutes, it becomes ruined. So it's not too hard to screw yourself, but the main thing is, this is your only shot at getting the Master Key. Ask Hacker for Master Key. Well, I suppose I could loan you the Master Key for a while. Just don't get into trouble, okay? 
I'll find you later when I'm done with all this and get it back. He hands you the key. Outstanding. 